The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, about God, it says, Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This passage teaches us that it's the desire of God for all to be saved. And to do that, they must come to the knowledge of the truth, the knowledge of the gospel. Later on, 2 Peter chapter 3 says it this way, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. That it means he's patient toward us. Can I get a witness? God been patient with you? If he hasn't been, you haven't been paying attention. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. These verses tell us that it's God's desire for men to be saved and that he doesn't want men to perish in their sin. God's desire is that we may believe. And because of this, God has revealed himself to man. He's revealed himself so we can repent, so we can believe, so we can be saved. You are saved, if you're a Christian this morning, you are saved because God revealed himself to you and there's no other reason why you are saved. But the question is, how does God reveal himself or make himself known to us? This morning in our Summer in the Psalm series, we open to this Psalm 19 where David is amazed. He's overwhelmed by how God has revealed himself. He's overwhelmed when he thinks about the fact that God made himself known to David. And this morning, we're going to see what God has done so that you may believe. God desires for you to believe, but we want to see what he's done so we can believe. But that leads to the question, has God revealed himself to you? Has he made himself personally known to you? And do you know him as your Lord and Savior? This morning, if you're able, stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word. The first six verses of Psalms 19, keep your Bibles open, we'll work our way down through to the end. As we work through this message, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork day unto day utters speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world in them. He has set a tabernacle for the sun which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end and there is nothing hidden from its heat. We haven't been hidden from its heat lately, have we? <laughs> Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word. Speak to our hearts now. And if there's one here who doesn't know you, today I ask you to reveal yourself to them. Reveal their need for you and reveal your love for them. And Father, for those of us who do know you, turn us back to you. Draw us closer to you, Lord. As we go further with you, we often become sort of numb, sort of distracted. Bring us back, Father, to an experience of worshiping you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we're going to dive right in. We're talking about, so you may believe, what did God do? Well, number one, God reveals himself through creation. God reveals himself through creation. This is known by scholars, by theologians, as what is known as general revelation. General revelation, meaning that everybody gets general revelation. Now, when we read this Psalms, we, we don't have any real idea when David wrote this. He could have wrote this while he was a shepherd boy out tending the sheep, walking with those sheep and living with them. Remember, we learned in Luke's gospel that the shepherds were tending the flocks by night. They stayed with those sheep day and night. And we could imagine David maybe being out there with those sheep in one of those fields. And at the night, he looks up and he sees the vastness of the skies and the heavens and he's overwhelmed by it. 
Maybe when he was a warrior out fighting one of his battles or when he was running from King Saul and he stayed out in the wilderness and he ran for years and years hiding out in caves and dens and valleys. And maybe one night out there he's just looking into the sky and he sees the vastness of heaven and he's just overwhelmed by what he sees. He may have wrote it while he was a king and he often would go out on his housetop, these kings had these palaces and they would have their housetops where they could walk out and look over their empires. And David may have been doing that and instead of looking over his empire, he may have looked over God's empire and saw the vastness of it. But whatever time it was, David was overwhelmed when he saw the glory of God and the handiwork of God and he heard the speech of day and night speaking to him and he understood that God had a message through creation for the whole world. That God is there and God is real. A couple of things about creation as a witness I want to show you. Number one, this tells us creation is an unmistakable witness. It is an unmistakable witness. Verse one, David says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Those two words are Genesis one words. If you know your Bible, God created the heavens and the earth and the firmament he speaks of. Right there in Genesis one, David comes back to that text Speaking of the heavens and the firmament, he uses a word here, plural, for heavens, heavens, more than one. Because the Bible teaches there is more than one heaven. There's the atmospheric heaven that we see up here above us where we see planes flying and so forth, this atmospheric heaven. Then there's this sort of universal heaven, the outer space heaven where men tread to go sometimes, dare to go. And there's the stars and the planets and that universe. And then there's the eternal heavens where God dwells and there every believer will long to dwell one day and be with Jesus in that great place that he's gone to prepare for us. Well, David couldn't see into the eternal heavens, but he could get a little glimpse of the outer space and he could get a little glimpse of this atmospheric heaven and looking around him, he's overwhelmed as they declare the glory of God. Warren Wiersbe said this, modern science would have us study natural laws and leave God out. But the psalmist looks at the marvels of heaven and earth and saw God. He saw in the vastness of space and the amazing discoveries that are are still being discovered in this universe. We're still discovering and we're discovering that we can't discover it all, that we can't exhaust it. We can't find the end of the universe because God has created a vast universe that's beyond us. John Phillips said, the stars are God's oldest testament. Oldest testament. And the word here for declares, the heavens declare, is an ongoing word. It it could be translated, the heavens are declaring. The heavens are declaring. Every time someone looks into the sky, the heavens are continually declaring God's glory. This speaks of the awesomeness of God. You know, sometimes you watch these shows on Discovery, you watch these shows uh, about the universe and scientific shows. I don't watch much of them. Maybe when the TV gets stuck on the channel and won't turn very long, I get stuck there for a few minutes. But when you watch them, you'll see people saying, man, the universe is so awesome. It's so amazing, the universe, the stars and the planets. It's just beyond us. It's just so amazing what we're discovering. But you know what the universe is saying? The creator is so amazing. The creator is beyond us. The one who put all this in place and holds all this, he's the amazing one. That's what the universe is saying to man, that there's a God in heaven who holds all of this by the word of his power. Charles Spurgeon years ago said this, Speaking of the heavens, they deliver to us such unanswerable arguments for a conscious, intelligent, planning, controlling, and presiding creator that no unprejudiced person can remain unconvinced by them. He who looks up to the firmament and then writes himself down an atheist brands himself at that same moment as an idiot or a liar. Hallelujah. I didn't say that, but I approve that message. The heavens are so amazing that human beings easily fall into worshiping them. You know that? Human beings just easily fall into worshiping. We've been studying Genesis, and we've studied in the early chapters of Genesis where astrology began and where men began to worship the stars and discover the zodiac and write all this down and begin to follow the stars looking for an answer, and men still worship these stars and still look for answers in them. But what they didn't know is that the stars were not to be worshiped. The stars are a witness to the one who is to be worshipped. 
They are a witness to the one that men are to bow down to. They are an unmistakable witness that there is a creator. Secondly, creation is an untiring witness. An untiring witness. Verse number two. Day unto day utters speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. Day by day, night by night, God is testifying to his existence. That he is real and that he is there. These Day and night speak a language, not an audible language, but no less clear and no less heard that God is a God of order. He's ordered everything. He's ordered the sun to come up and the sun to go down. And when you read Genesis chapter one, he gave us the order of how he created everything. And interestingly, he gave us the order of how everything functions. And here we are thousands of years later, not millions of years, by the way, thousands of years later. And it's still functioning as God described it in Genesis chapter one. Day unto day, night unto night, utter speech. It, it tells us of a God who is a God of order. Interestingly, the naturalists and the evolutionists and those type people want us to believe that all of this came out of chaos. You realize they want us to believe that there was nothing and then there was chaos and it created everything that is orderly. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense to think you can have a whole lot of chaos and it work into great order. Instead, the Bible says that God created everything in order. And if you, and if you follow the Bible through to the end, you know what's going to happen at the end of time when God destroys all of this? As a matter of fact, how God is going to destroy it is through chaos. He created it in order. And then when you get to Genesis, what you, I mean, when you get to Revelation, what you see is chaos breaking out. And what happens is man who's lived in this great order that God has put in place, Place, has lived by it, counted on it. All of a sudden, the seasons are different. Time is different. The sun, the sun and the moon are out of place. And man doesn't know what's going on because the God of heaven who created an order is now letting it descend into chaos. That's how God is going to end the world. These things declare a God who is in control, God who ordered everything. And day after day, they testify to God's existence. That leads to the third thing. Creation is an understandable witness, an understandable witness. Verse three and four, there is no language, there's, excuse me, there's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Now, I want you to notice that in that verse, you probably have the word there is or something of that nature that's in italics and the word where is in italics. That's because they're not part of the original Hebrew. They're placed there to, uh, to give us an understanding to make the Hebrew translate into English. Verse four says their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the earth, to the end of the world. That word, that the word line there means message. Their message has gone out. But I want you to understand this text the way it's written in Hebrew. If we just, if we took those words out, it would say this, no speech nor language. Their voice is not heard. You see what that, it's, it's sort of like saying this. They don't audibly speak. They don't speak English. They don't speak Hebrew. They don't speak Greek. They don't speak Spanish, but their message goes out. Their message goes out to the ends of the earth. Do you know, folks, there's no place where the stars and the sky and the moon and the sun do not reach. Now, I've been in some places that were so far back in the country, I thought we were going to have to pump sunlight in, but there's no place where their message does not reach. Wherever man is, and by the way, beyond where man is today, in the uninhabited places where no man lives, the sun and the moon still reach. The heaven still covers that place. I've told you this. This is why. This is why no one goes back into the woods somewhere in some dark place in the Amazon or anywhere else and find a tribe of atheists. No one goes and finds a tribe of atheists because they go and find a tribe of pagans because they haven't been informed, but they know there's a God in heaven because the moon and the sun and the stars and creation speaks and they know there's something greater than them to worship. And so in their, in their uh, rough way, in their primitive way, they're still trying to worship. This is why we must take the, the gospel to all the nations because people will understand that there is a God. We must take them there and share the gospel to them. This is why Paul writes in Romans 1.20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. That's almost like a, 
oxymoron. His invisible attributes are clearly seen. What does that mean? That means God's power is seen in creation. Man can clearly see, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Why we must take the gospel to the ends of the earth is that man still without excuse. Where the sun shines and the moon shines and the stars hang, God is speaking and men need the gospel. So God reveals himself through creation. But secondly, I want you to see God reveals himself through scripture. God reveals himself through scripture. Picking up in chapter 19, verse number 7. Verse number 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. This passage speaks of the Bible, God's special revelation. Creation is God's general revelation. Anyone, a person who cannot read, a person who will never read, can be warned by creation. Not just what he can see, but what he can feel, what he can hear, what he can experience. He's warned by creation. He's taught by creation. That's general. But scripture is more specific. Many theologians call it special revelation. For you see, in the skies, God reveals that he's powerful. In the scripture, God reveals that he's personal. He's called a father. He's called a son. He's called the Holy Spirit. He's called a savior and a Lord. We're told that he loves us, that he watches over us, that he cares for us, that he forgives us, that he has patience. We read it earlier. He has patience with us. God reveals himself as personal. Now, the most personal and the most special revelation of God is Jesus. The Bible says Jesus was God who became flesh and dwelt among us. John in John chapter 1 says... We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God became a man and dwelt among us. Jesus was with the disciples there in the upper room. And Philip said, show us the Father, Lord, and we'll believe. And Jesus, remember what he said to him? He who's seen me has seen the Father. So Philip saw Jesus and he saw the Father. Now, how do you and I see Jesus? We have to see him through the scriptures. This is why the Bible is special revelation because the scriptures, the scriptures reveal to us Jesus, God's special revelation. Jesus said it this way in John 5, 39. You search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and these are they which testify of me. He's telling these Old Testament, these believers who believed in the Old Testament, that was their Bible. He said, you're searching them. You think if you do this and you do that, you'll have eternal life. But they've been telling you about me all along. I've been the promised one who's coming. I'm the promised Messiah. They are testifying to me. And today you and I still have the Bible which testifies of Jesus to us so that we might believe and we might be saved. In this verses, the five verses that we read here, God uses six different terms to describe his word. He uses law, testimony, statutes, commandment, fear, and judgments to describe the Bible. I want to show you just a couple of things he tells us about the Bible and why it's important and how God reveals himself through it. So the first thing I want you to see is what the Bible is. What the Bible is. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to show you three things out of these five verses that God says the Bible is. Number one, he says, it is the perfect law. It is the perfect law. There is no error in the Bible, either historical or spiritual. There's no error in the Bible. The Bible doesn't tell us anything that's wrong. We believe as, as Bible-believing Christians that the Bible is God's inerrant, infallible word. It's true. It's God's true and perfect law. 2 Timothy 3, 16, Paul wrote this. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. That's the Greek word 
That means inspiration is the Greek word that means God breathed. It means God breathed. You know, when you begin the Bible and you begin the story of Adam and Eve, remember creation? The Bible says God breathed the breath of life into Adam and he became a living being. God formed him from the dust of the ground and he breathed life into him. This is telling us that God breathed the life into scripture. God inspired every person who wrote the scriptures with his God-inspired words. This is why the Bible is a living book because God breathed life into it. And that Bible is profitable for doctrine. It tells you what to believe. It's profitable for reproof. It'll tell you what not to believe and what not to do. It's profitable for correction. It'll tell you what's right. And it'll tell you, it's instruction in righteousness. It'll tell you how to stay right. It will instruct you on how to live because it's God's perfect law. The second thing he says about it is it's the sure testimony. The sure testimony. The word of God does not change. It's sure and steadfast. It's God's witness to man of what is true and what is right and what is good. And no matter what this world does, no matter what our country does, when it violates the word of God, it is wrong and God's sure testimony is correct. You know, if you were to go back, you know, unfortunately, we have an election this year. If you've been paying attention, it is unfortunate. Every time I watch, it gets more and more unfortunate. Unfortunately, we have an election this year. And if you were to look at their platforms, the party platforms, when they put them out, and then you could go back in history and you could look at the party platforms, say, from 1980 or 1970 or 1960, and you could go back and just keep going back all their party platforms. What you would see is rapid and massive changes in those. Now, these are people that at one time believed this. This is what we're going to stand for. A few years later, this ain't, we're going to stand for something different now. See, some people are hoping in this stuff. But they're hoping in something that's not sure, that changes. When you put your life on God and his word, it's a sure and solid testimony that does not change. The winds of time, the winds of change, what's popular. God never stuck his finger in the air and said, let me see which way the wind's blowing down on earth. Psalms 119, 89 says this, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. You know what that means? There won't be any business meetings in heaven voting to correct or delete anything God said. Amen. Nobody's going to make a motion that we, we adjust this and we change it for the times. It's forever settled in, in heaven. As a matter of fact, let me just tell you, when you get to heaven, the Bible's going to be there. When you, when, you, when you read Revelation chapter 20 and men are standing before God, the Bible says the books are going to be open. And I believe one of those books is going to be the Bible. The Bible is going to be open. And just what I told you a few minutes ago, when Paul said that the heathen and the people who cannot read, there's a God in heaven who's testified against that, that he's real and they don't believe. He said they're without excuse. Can you imagine? Can you imagine when we stand before God? And there's Bibles in every store. Almost every store you walk into, you can get a Bible. People will give you free Bibles. There's internet Bibles. And we're going to stand before God and we didn't know the front from the back. And we don't think you're going to be without excuse. You're going to be without excuse. You knew the horrible scopes and the stock markets and all this other stuff. And you're going to be without excuse. You're going to be without excuse why you know all this about the phone and all this about an app. And you didn't know this about the word of God. The word of God is settled in heaven. It's a sure testimony. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 18, for assuredly I say to you till heaven and earth pass away one jot or tittle. Those are the smallest, the jot and the tittle is the smallest part of the Hebrew alphabet. A jot literally is like taking your fine point pen and touching the paper with it. That's it. And a tittle is a so small little, little move. Just, I mean, you just barely move the pen. Those are letters in the Hebrew alphabet. One jot or one tittle. The smallest part of it will by no means pass away from the law till all is fulfilled. None of it will be, it'll all be there when you get there. It's forever settled. It's sure. Build your life on what God says and your life will be a, built on a solid foundation the third thing he says about it, it's the right statutes, the right statutes. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart, he says. 
The word statutes mean precepts, rules for daily living. You know, people are wondering, how do we live in a day like this? How do we live when just what we thought was right five years ago now is being voted down? Just a few years ago, the majority of people believed this was right. Now they're telling us the majority of people believe that that we've held forever was wrong and now this is the right way. How do we live when everything seems to be upside down and everything seems to be changing? And I mean, it's just all over the place. How do we live? Get your Bible. Get your Bible and learn how to live your daily life. You want to know how to, you want to, know how to live? Get, open your Bible. You want to know how to deal with money? Open your Bible. You want to know how to deal with relationships? Open your Bible. You want to know how to be a parent? Open your Bible. God's right statutes are there for daily living. They endure forever. They are not passing. What the Bible is. Secondly, I want you to see what the Bible does. What the Bible does. Because the Bible is the, the word of the living God. And it is also the living word of God. It's not a stagnant book. It's not dead and dusty. This is why we shouldn't approach the Bible, you know, dead and dusty ourselves. We ought to be excited about the Bible because this is living truth from a living God. The, God. the God of heaven breathed this out and he still speaks through it. I just was on the phone this week with a man who told me that the, he, he gave me his testimony of how he came back to the Lord. And he didn't come back to the Lord because the preacher preached. God sent him to a verse in the Bible. And when he read the Bible, God spoke to his heart so clearly. And then God, by his providence, had him encounter those same verses within a week period, about two or three different times. And he told me it was those verses in the Bible that God used to turn my life around. God's word is powerful. This is why Hebrews 4, 12 says this, 4, 11 and 4, 12 says this, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Look at that. Is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Okay, this is listener participation time. You ever been reading the Bible and you felt like the Bible was reading you? If you've ever read it more than once, you have. Because what'll happen is it'll start telling you your thoughts. I've read things in the Bible and I'm not, I've not even thought this out loud. I've never told anybody. I've not even dwelt on it. And God spoke to my heart and said, you're thinking wrong there. Don't go there. Your thoughts are wrong. It'll, it'll, the Bible will discern the intents of what you really intend. It is God's word. But there's one thing I want to show you that it does, that out of all this that it tells us, but one thing I want to show you that the Bible does, it converts the soul. It converts the soul. Do you see that in verse 7? The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Converting the soul. The Hebrew word here means to bring back. The word convert means to bring back or turn back. And as you know, if you know your Bible, conversion is a big thing. Subject, a big theme all through the Bible. In both the Old and New Testament, this truth of bringing back or turning back is something that God speaks about from beginning to end. He speaks about people being converted. Jesus said it here in Matthew 18, verse 3. Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted, unless you are turned back, and become his little children, little children being humble, ones who are willing to listen and willing to learn, who's willing to set and be humble. Unless you are turned back and become his little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Listen, that passage tells us that no matter what you believe, no matter what you've done, if you've never been turned back, you're not going to heaven. If you're on the same road you've always been on, you're, you're a good person, you're doing your best. If you're on that road, you're not going to heaven because you must be turned back that you enter the kingdom of God. Amen. And this is not converting from a Baptist to a Catholic or from a Catholic to a Methodist or from whatever to whatever. Those are fine or whatever. This is converting to God. This is being turned back to God. It speaks of the deep inner recesses of the heart and soul being changed. Not the outward activity but the inner heart. Jesus described it, same terminology, same idea as being born again. 
being born again. John chapter 3, Nicodemus says, excuse me, Jesus says to Nicodemus, Jesus answered and said to him, Moses, surely I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Listen, unless a person be born again, he's not going to go stand before heaven and, and, and look at heaven. He's not going to get to see it at all. He's not even going to get to drive by in eternity. He's not going anywhere near heaven. He's not going to see it at all unless he's born again. And this is also why people on earth, when you talk to them about God, are you talking talk to them about the church or you talk to them about what God is doing in your life. They have no interest. They don't see it. They can't see God in the world at all. Why? Because they're not born again. This is why even God's witnessing in the heavens and God's witnessing in the sky, man's without excuse. But until he's born again, he can't go to heaven until he's had a heart transplant from above. This conversion, this born again, this speaks of a new life that one receives through faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Most people believe in God. They have some thoughts about God, some ideas about God. Most people believe they're going to go to heaven. We went out in this community and we surveyed every single person in Wyandotte County. The vast majority of those people will tell you they're going to go to heaven. But most of those people have never been turned back. And when, you're not been, you, know, when you haven't been turned back, here's your, here's, your, here's your answer. Well, I'm a good person. It's not what he's asking. I've not done, I've not done these bad things. It's not what he's asking. I've been religion. It's not what he's asking. Have you ever been turned back? Has God so gripped your heart that you've been turned back from going your own way and you've been born again? Now, how, how does the Bible do this? How does the Bible convert the soul? Well, he tells us a little bit of it here in this text. He tells us, number one, that it makes wise the simple. You see it there in verse number seven. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. See, we often have these simple thoughts about God in that God is good and I'm good and I don't bother God and God doesn't bother me. I haven't done anything all that bad. Surely God's going to let me in. Surely God's going to let me in. I'm not a bad person. I haven't done what so-and-so's done. I, I've never murdered anyone. I've witnessed to many people. I particularly remember one man. I witnessed to us sharing the gospel. And he said, well, I'm not a bad person. I've never murdered anybody. So, so I told him, I said, do you believe that murderers be in heaven? He's like, no, I don't believe anybody's ever committed murder or be in heaven. I said, well, here's what I know. I know the Bible says Moses killed a man with his bare hands. I believe he made it to heaven. Amen. The Bible says Paul was consenting unto Stephen's death and that he was guilty of, of Stephen's murder. I believe Paul made it to heaven. And here's the deal. They made it to heaven, although they did, make mur they did commit murder. You hadn't committed murder. And if you don't trust Jesus, you're not going to make it. See, we have to be wise unto salvation. We have to be made wise that we know that, that I'm not good enough on my own and God's not minding his own business. I thought, you know, I wasn't bothering God. What I didn't realize was I killed God's son by my sin. 2 Timothy 3.15 says this, and that from childhood, you have known the Holy Scripture. Stop right there. And that from childhood. That's why we started this service with that commissioning to go out because these children from childhood need to be taught the Word of God. Parents, you need to have your children in Bible study, in Sunday school. You need to have them in Awanas. You need to have them in vacation Bible school. And you need to teach and read the Word of God at home because from childhood, they can know the Scriptures. As a matter of fact, just to be honest with you, we would be better off to try to teach a child the Bible than you would to be able to try to teach a 50-year-old man the Bible. You know why? Because a child's going to retain it. 50 years from now, you teach a child a verse of Scripture, they'll remember some of that. You teach me something at 8 o'clock in the morning, I forgot it before the sun goes down. Right? It's like driving a nail in concrete, man. It's all set. We need to teach them from childhood. We're to teach them the word of God from childhood. That's why we've got to reach these children. Why? Because the scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation. It opens your heart to see that you are a sinner and that Christ is a savior and he will save you. It makes you wise for salvation through faith. Secondly, not only do they make, us wise, make the wise simple, but they enlighten the eyes. They enlighten the eyes. Verse number eight, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The commandment of the Lord is pure. Um, this speaks of God's commandments that open our eyes. Paul said, I would not have known sin if not for the law. 
What makes us understand sin is that we go to God's law. Most people are saying, I'm a good person. I'm a pretty good person. I've never done anything all that bad. You can't take anybody through the Ten Commandments that doesn't fail the test. There's only ten questions, and you're not going to pass. You're not going to pass. You're not going to not covet, not lie, not steal, not blaspheme, not honor God's day perfectly. Look, there's a ton of people aren't honoring God's day today. They're just, they're just not doing it. They're doing it whatever they want to. God said, it's my day. Just broke God's law. That's why Paul said in Romans 3.19, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, look at this, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. What does that mean, every mouth may be stopped? That every mouth will be stopped defending themselves. When you stand before God's law and you stand before God, you're not going to say, well, you know, I was a good person. I'm doing the best I can. Listen, if that's you this morning, please, in the name of Jesus, stop defending yourself. You don't need to defend yourself. What you need to do is run to the one who died for your sin. Stop excusing yourself and defending yourself and say, God, I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me. God, I've lied. God, I've blasphemed. God, I've stolen. God, I've hated. God, I've been greedy. God, I've been covetous. God, I've been lazy. Whatever else it is, Lord, I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me. And by the grace of God, he will, because that's why Jesus died. That's why he died. And whosoever calls on the name of the Lord may be saved. And the only way we're going to call is to hear the word of God. Then we know that all have sinned and come short. And we know the wages of sin is death. But we know the grace of God brings life. That leads to the last thing. David's working through this text. He's he's talking about God's glory and creation. Then he talks about what he's learned in the scriptures. And now God's speaking down to his heart. And this is the third thing. God reveals himself through conviction. In verse 12 through 14, David is speaking as a man whom God is speaking to. He's speaking as a man who is under conviction of his own relationship with God or his lack thereof. Verse 12, I'm going to walk through this very quickly. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. David's not talking about the things everybody else knows. He's talking about the stuff only me and you know, Lord. Cleanse me from that. Now you're getting serious. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. David speaks as a man under a great burden that God has brought conviction upon his heart. He's standing before, this is between him and God now, and he's speaking his prayer to God. And he prays three quick things I want to show you because he's under conviction. The first thing is he says, cleanse me, cleanse me. Under conviction, he asks God to wash him of secret sins. God, cleanse me. And, and, and I, who can understand his errors? Meaning, I just, I don't even know how deep my sin is, Lord, but I know it's there. Please cleanse me. When you get under conviction, you want to be right with God. You want to get sin out of your heart. You want to get sin out of your life. You don't want to walk around with a filthy heart and a filthy mind and a filthy la- uh, mouth and filthy hands. You want to be washed. Then he says, keep me. Verse 13, keep me back. Keep back your servants from presumptuous sin. He basically says, Lord, when you cleanse me, don't let me go back to living that way again. And, and don't let me presume on your grace. Presumptuous sins. It means to presume that I can go on living like I can, like I want to. It's okay. Listen, I want to tell you this morning. I, I love being a Christian and I love being a Baptist Christian. And we believe that once you're saved, you're always saved. I believe in eternal security because salvation is a work of God. But I want to tell you, there's a lot of people who just act like once you get saved, what you, don't, what you do after that doesn't matter because, you, you know, you're not going to go to hell anyhow. So what you do is okay. If you're lackadaisical, if you're lazy, if you're unspiritual, it's okay because I'm saved. Listen, I want to tell you something. That's presuming on God's grace. That's full of pride. That smacks of pride. Listen, I want to tell you this. What you do before you're saved doesn't matter. Because you're not going to heaven anyhow. You're condemned already. I don't care if you give everything you have to the poor and you're lost. You're still going to hell and you're going to hell broke. But you're still going to hell. 
But when you get saved, listen, everything you do matters after you get saved. Everything you do matters after you get saved. Every second of every day matters after you get saved. And nothing matters until you get saved. So as a Christian, help keep me back from living in pride to thinking, what I do doesn't matter, I'm saved, it's okay. Don't live that way. And by the way, don't presume if you're not saved, don't presume that there'll always be time to get saved. That's presuming too. You may be here today thinking, well, I might get saved, but I might do it next Sunday. You, there may not be a next Sunday for you. God may never call you again. And listen, you may want to get saved today, but there's no promise that you'll want to get saved ever again. Did you know that? When you want to get saved, that's the time to get saved because there's no promise that you will ever want to get saved again. That's how it works. The devil will steal that away. I believe there's many people who've come in this church who wanted to get saved who didn't. And you know what? Today, they don't want to get saved anymore. That's why when you talk to them, they're just like a stone wall. They wanted to get saved for a few minutes. They didn't. The devil snatched that seed away. They presumed on God's grace. And now they won't get saved. Let me give you the last thing. He prays, cleanse me. He prays, keep me. He plays, prays, accept me. I could preach this as a whole sermon right here. <laughs> accept me. Actually, he prays, Lord, make me acceptable. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. You know, we're often telling people, hey, you got to accept Jesus. You got to accept Jesus. You got to accept Jesus. You know what David was praying? Jesus, would you accept me? Jesus, would you have mercy on me and accept me? See, this morning, that's what we need to pray. We need to pray Acts 3.19. Repent, therefore, and be converted. Repent, turn from your own way, and be turned back to God, that your sins may be blotted out. When you turn back to God, what God will do is he will blot your sins out. He will cover them with his blood. So that, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. This, this verse is a great verse to understand what it means to turn to God. So let me tell you this morning, some of you are Christians and you're sort of walking through the motions and you're sort of dry and you're sort of just dead in your faith, nothing going on. You're not close to God anymore. What do you need to do? Repent and be turned back. And when you are, you know what's going to happen? God's going to cover your sins. with He's going to wash them. And then what's going to happen is there's going to be a flood of refreshing come in your life. Sometimes people think, man, you know, I'm going to church, but nothing's happening. The church service isn't this and the church service isn't that. Maybe I need to have my sins blotted out. I need to be refreshed. There's a lot of Christians this morning. One of the reasons we need revival in America is because Christians need to have their sins blotted out. And refreshing come from God's presence. Yes.